Lois Romano wrote this wonderful article just for the Nichols trial, and she really researched it, and she went and listened to a whole bunch of people uh, in order to prepare it, and it was good. I thought it was good. Jeffrey Tubin also wrote an article <laughs> that appeared in the New Yorker. Jeffrey Tubin blew into town and um, had dinner with my mother and my wife and me at the Brown Palace, and uh, we learned a great deal about Jeffrey Tubin in the course of the evening. Uh, my mother, of course, was, was present when I was born, and uh, <laughs> So she knew me pretty well, but he really wasn't interested too much in talking to her. It was all about what Jeffrey Tubin had covered. And he finished, we finished dinner, and he got up and said, I'll take care of the check, and wandered across the room. My mother looked at me and she said, dear, who is that sententious little shit? <laughs> <laughs> so my mother liked your article. You're a winner now. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm flattered to have been asked to do this. Um, I didn't know Michael before I did that story, but everybody in Washington knows of Michael. So even though I had not met him, um, there were so many stories that preceded him, and some of them were even true. Um, Edward Bennett Williams used to tell people that he wished he could walk behind Michael with a basket and collect his discarded ideas. Um, and so when I was researching the story, and even when I was researching coming here, I cast a wide net. And so it was that after Yom Kippur last night, I emailed Michael at midnight and said, tell me about the four pregnant heifers. I bet you haven't heard that story. <laughs> uh, and since it has a Texas tinge to it, I think we should hear about it. Michael? Well after the Connolly, during the Connolly trial, I was living in Loudoun County on 32 acres, an old house. And after the trial was over, uh, one fine day a truck pulled up, and out were four bred Santa Gertrudis heifers. These are these cross Texas shorthorn, very good animals. They're heifers. Now, it was a, a, a story about a bull got later, and um, the, we put them in the pasture. And the first calf that was dropped was a bull calf. And it was her first, um, her first calf, and it was hard. The vet and I had to pull the calf and get him up to, uh, to suckle and get him started. And it's, I then read that. But wait a minute, we haven't said where the heifers came from. From John and Nellie Connolly. Because? Because, well, because John Connolly was acquitted by the jury. Um, and his gift and his thank you to you was for pregnant heifers. Was, yes, was for <laughs> bred heifers. Um, <laughs> And this was big, actually, we're in the John Connolly Court facility. You know, I became good friends with John and Nellie over the years, represented John and his family later on. Um, that was a, for Edward Bennett Williams, that was a rematch. We had lost the Bobby Baker case. He had lost the Bobby. That was my first case I worked on. And as the verdict came in, the jury said, not guilty. Ed put his hand on my leg and he said, this makes up for the last one. Um, this was over a $10,000 bribe that Connolly was to have taken. And Connolly was a wealthy man, right? Yes. He didn't really need the tent for, for price milk supports. Yes. So the way the story, and we, I think we need to tell the bull part, because well, the way I've yeah. heard the story Go ahead. Huh? Yes. was that you, he gave you two bulls, and then you turned around and gave those two bulls to Fidel Castro, and Connolly was pissed. Actually, well, none of those things are true. Okay. First, That's what I said. Sometimes they're true. First, Sometimes he they're gave not. us four bred heifers. All right? Second, um, yes, the bull that was born eventually went to Canada and on to Cuba because they were trying to introduce more Santa Gertrudis strains into their agriculture because Santa Gertrudis is a very healthy uh, breed. And that seemed to be the right thing to do. And you've heard about that. And then. Uh, but the idea that, that I had received a bull and that it went to Canada first started in the style section of a newspaper called the Washington <laughs> Post. Um, and it was Maxine Cheshire that wrote it, your colleague. Um, barely, so, barely. And, well, <laughs> oh, 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 she was that, way ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, so, well, uh, that, no, this is going to be an interesting interview. Isn't it? Um, and, and, Conley, and Conley heard the rumor. And... Um, he said, he said, I heard that. He said, I, I didn't give any bulls. 
He said, I gave you heifers, so I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Um, so that was, so he wasn't pissed. Um, he was fine with the sire he, going he to He was fine. You Cuba? know, I never talked to a specific about that, but I'll tell you <laughs> something. You know, John came back to Texas, and he got into real estate deals with Ben Barnes, and he went bankrupt. Oh, wow. And in the, and in this real estate industry at that time, this was a big deal. John and Nellie, did, you know, he had to sell everything. And, but because he'd been a target before, the SEC had other investigations or things going on, and nobody in this town would represent him because he didn't have any money. And so John and I used to sit up in my office and deal with the legal problems that were the fallout for him and for his family from all of this. So, you know, we're kind of political opposites in so many ways, but he had been a decent person as a as a defendant, he was, uh, he did a great, you know, he, 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 was, he had a great story to tell, and, and he told it. So one more question on that trial. Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of it is that you brought in a bevy of uh, amazing character witnesses that included Jackie Kennedy and, and Lady Bird. Um, Lady Bird Johnson, the why, best character witness we ever had. Why well, Billy Graham? Well, Billy... <laughs> There's a story about that that I can't tell. <laughs> That's what uh, I'm getting at here. But um, Billy Graham had known John Conway. Of course, he had Barbara Jordan. Mm -hmm. That was, that Barbara agreed to, because she'd been in the Texas legislature. Lady Bird Johnson was great. And Billy Graham gets on the stand, and um, Ed says, uh, well, will you state your name? He says, I am the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. He said, and sir, what is your business or occupation? He said, I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world. And jury number five said, Amen! <laughs> <laughs> and they had her. Yeah. <laughs> so, Good get on that. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. Um, so I want to um, go back and forth from the past and the present. I want to talk a little bit about the present and the future. Um, We've heard a little bit on the panel before about the challenges of being a human rights lawyer today. Um, but one of the things, that, things that's also happening is that there's a lot of discussion about human rights that's going on today mm -hmm. because of what this challenging yeah. environment is. Mm -hmm. So are there some opportunities here, uh, and I, I'll say under Trumpism, um, are, there, are there some opportunities to, um, to be a, a, a strong human rights attorney and to take on some of this stuff and to kind of turn the tide back? Of, of course. I mean, I've got, I have a new book coming out tomorrow called Mythologies of State and Monopoly Power. There are these mythologies about race and ethnicity and poverty and so on that mask the exercises of power. And we lawyers are mythology busters. Um, can I give you a brief example? Please. There's a statue, there was, on the University of North Carolina campus of Silent Sam, the Confederate veteran. And under the leadership of an African-American graduate student, the students pulled it down. Now, it's regarded as vandalism, this and that, the other thing, but I want you to think about this for a minute. Silent Sam. Jerry Wilson, the uh, graduate student. I walked past that statue, and I was horrified. To be honest, I was up at Duke, I would see it because I knew it had been erected in 1913. It wasn't an object of remembrance of somebody who left home and family. Um, but what does Jerry Wilson see when he walks by? He's an African-American man. He knows his odds of being shot dead by a police officer or multi, many times that of a white person, that his odds of going to jail are many times that of a white person. And he looks at that statue and he <coughs> remembers that most of the money for it when it was erected in 1913 was given by a man named Julian Carr an avid supporter of the Ku Klux Klan and of lynching, who made a speech at the dedication of that statue, in which he bragged about having horsewhipped an African-American woman until, quote, her skirt hung in shreds for having disrespected a white Southern lady. He's made to walk past that every day. Now, if there's anybody in this room that is not affected by that human story, who could not at least conjure up the idea that they would understand why he'd want to pull it down, and then I don't know who that person is. Don Woods and I know that the Nichols case, they had 167 dead people. We had 12 jurors in the box, all of whom had taken an oath, said they supported the death penalty, because that's what you get. And 
we, what, what we put on 85 witnesses, something like that. I mean, we, we tried the hell out of that case because we had a human story to tell. So that's what, that's what we do. And that's what you do. The, why is the Post such a great newspaper? What was, we could, you know, what, Woodward, Bernstein, Ben Bradley, Kay Graham, Lois Romano? But here's the thing, you've spent your whole career debunking these mythologies, these entrenched way people think to try to affect positive change. Now we have a president who is using that same tactic to sort of undo some of that. I mean, he doesn't seem to have respect for the rule of law. He doesn't want refugees. He's against immigrants. And he does this through Twitter. So is he debunking the good mythologies to sort no. of do the? No, he's reinforcing them, but in my opinion. Okay. He is giving people permission to exercise these atavistic racist sentiments. He is going Newt Gingrich ten times better with why the contract is that good? on America. What? But that's not good. No, it's of course not. He, so he is he is invoking our fear of Muslims, our fear right. of this, our fear of that. John Henry Falk spoke in Austin, Texas, some years ago, right after the, the director of the FBI, and um, who had talked about the dangers to America and that so forth. And John Henry said, "Well, I." I know about the dangers to America. I was a United States Marshal. And I was a United States Marshal that patrolled Lake Austin. I was 10 years old. And um, my friend Billy and I would patrol. And um, we had a chicken house. And um, we would, one day we went in that chicken house and we were feeling up around for the, for the eggs. And we were maybe up on the top shelf. And Billy put his hand on a chicken snake that was up there. And he screamed, chicken snake. And we ran out of that house. And the door of the thing closed behind us. And my courage, oh, my courage had blown out my leg into my tennis shoe. And uh, <laughs> my mother came out and said, John Henry Falk, what the hell are you doing? And I said, Mama, there's a chicken snake. And she said, John Henry, a chicken snake can't hurt you. And I said, yes, I know, but it could scare you so bad you hurt yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got you. Yeah, I can't do that. <laughs> okay, um, we might um, pass out some cards, by the way, for some questions. If you have some, just send them. Now, you when, when did you join the post? Um, uh, well, I joined twice. Uh huh. Um, in '82, and then I went back. I left for a little bit, um, and I went back in 2015. Okay. I left so when it was then, going downhill, and then Jeff Bezos bought it, and I went back. Yeah, <laughs> so, yes, but Ben I was, was there still, through Ben, yeah. Ben, ben, ben Bradley. Yeah, okay. Ben Bradley. And Sa Bradley. Was Sal did you work with Sally Quinn, or was she, she doing She was kind now? of moving on by then, because he, you know, it was kind of weird having them both in the same building, so she kind of was writing books, and, but he was, he and Mrs. Graham were very strong there. They were there, yes, because. Yeah, and Williams uh, and Conley was you know, representing them. You were colleagues with Ronnie Kessler. Yes. Ronnie Kessler had written a story about Baby Rebozo. Oh, we had to tell the Baby Rebozo and Be story. And Baby sued the, that he'd been involved in stock fraud. So Rebozo sued the Washington Post. And um, I, I got the case. Ed said, well, you go do the case. Well, Rebozo would not admit he was a public figure. Now, this is the days before Google and the Internet. So I had a, a, a paralegal assemble three boxes of cards, each of which contained a clipping of a public a newspaper clipping about Baby Rebozo. And I put him in front of me, and I took one card at a time, asking questions in the deposition, which just drove him crazy. Um, he was a public figure for those of you yes, who, were, was a who were not figure. born then. Well, he, he was Nixon's best some, friend. Yes, he was Nixon's best friend. You probably don't, you don't remember Baby Rebozo. At one point, he lost his temper. He started yelling at Ronnie as a hooligan and so on. It was a great <laughs> record. And I thought the best way to get this would be to take Richard Nixon's deposition. Uh, of course, that would show that he was a public figure, Nixon's friend. And so then I got summoned to Kay Graham and Ben Bradley's office. And um, I guess lawyer, kind of, what, I can't say what Kay said. Can I? Cause kind of no, afraid. sure you can. Okay, all right. Well, Kay. She had a salty mouth. Yeah, sure, sure. She had a salty <laughs> mouth. Would you remember during the early stages of Woodward and Bernstein when John Mitchell said, we're going to put Kay Graham's tits in a ringer? 
Is it? Okay. Well, we're sitting there, and I've talked, and Ben is saying, you know, blah, 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 and Ben Price says, okay, you know, if we take Nixon's deposition, that kind of declares war on him all over again. And Kay looked and said, Ben, what's he going to do? Put my tits in the ringer again? She said, I've been thinking, you know, I could use a little more up here. <laughs> <laughs> one of her other great lines was early in Watergate, when the Post was the only one breaking stories. Um, nobody else had caught the story yet. And it was, everybody was very nervous because nobody knew where it was going. And at one point she said to Ben Bradley, if this is such a fucking great story, how come no one else is writing it for us? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Pulitzer's later, they, then yeah. the president resigned. Right, right. So, um, and then, okay, what, during those Williams and Connolly days, you had a couple of other really great cases. Weren't, that remind me what they were. They were very high profile. Well, there was a select, Selective service one, well, right? What, yes, but what happened was I got interested in selective service law. Okay. In 67. I started joining the firm in 66. And uh, some of us founded the Selective Service Law Reporter because people needed to know about this. And I sat down and read every selective service case decided, draft case decided in the United States since 1864. And I wrote a book about how to try selective service cases and did that. And I told Ed Williams, look, I need to go off and do this. And uh, you know, this is about, and he said, well, okay, um, because children of the firm's clients are starting to get draft notices, and I, that was so that is interesting. And Ed said, fine, but I'm not going to interrupt your salary. They're, they're not going to pay you anything over there. Just keep your office and come in every once in a while and bill an hour or two and so on, which was typical. That was so great. In 75, I went up to represent Cameron Bishop in Denver. And he came, are you going into Denver? I said, yeah. I said, to represent that bomber? He said, you know, he said, I could find you a communist bomber in Baltimore, and maybe if you get back on weekends and bill an hour or two. <laughs> but, anyway. so, um, so one of the great stories, and not so great for you when you were 26, is, is the, the Brennan story, which you and I had talked about. And it, it gets... It, it only gets like a paragraph in all your biographies now. But it was a very big deal to get, um, to be selected as a Supreme Court clerk. You were number yes. one in your class. And you're driving cross country with a wife and two children. Yes. And how is it that you're informed that well, this is not going down well? <laughs> I had had some discussions with Brennan before. He had called me back to Washington. I'd met in his chambers and talked to him. And... Um, and he said he, that was okay, but then get halfway across the country, I get a call. He's had, you know, second, third thoughts, whatever it is. We later find out that he was influenced by Warren, who thought that his friend making me a clerk would help Ronald Reagan get to be elected governor of California, and have California politics. There was word that the FBI was involved, Abe Fortas, ah, I don't know. But I get there, and Brennan pulls the rug. So now I've got a lease on a house, I've got $20, and I have a gasoline credit card, and a wife and two children. <laughs> there I am. And um, I need a job. Now, did he tell you why? He, like, what, how did he, what did he say to you? All I mean, how does he all explain he that All he said, the final, the, the last was, when we first met in his chambers, he said, I want you to write out for me a story of what politics you've done. And I said, okay, I will do that for your eyes only because it's a confidential relationship. It, but you have to agree not to disclose it to anybody because I have a First Amendment right not to have you do that. And he said, you know, I, I'm a Supreme Court justice and you're not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, you're dictating terms. I said, well, I, sir, the, I, these are the same terms that you used in refusing to answer Senator McCarthy's questions at your confirmation hearing, and I don't see what the problem is. Um, I was a smart ass. <laughs> yeah, said, but, so he said, okay, you're my clerk. He did that. But then when he pulled the rug, he just called and said, no, we can't go through with this. So there I am without a job. But I had sent a resume to Ed Williams. And I went to Ed Williams' office. I had an appointment with him. And he said, what happened to you? So I told him the story. He said, I don't believe that. Bill Brennan's one of my best friends. He wouldn't do that. And I said, well, sir, you the phone number is executive 21640, whatever it is, you can call him up. Well, maybe I will. 
So I wasn't thinking of hiring anybody. I said, well, no, you know, I mean, I'm not here. I <laughs> said, oh, okay, I'll think about this. And I went back, I left him a phone number, went, and I got, no sooner got back to where I was in the staying, and the phone rang, he said, all right, he said, you're, you're hired to come in on Monday if you want. He said, I don't know what we're supposed to pay you, but we'll, I'll find out. So that started, and, you know, there it was. I was number 10 on the letterhead. And, um, and at, at 26, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so if you were, you were, you would have been kind of part of the resistance, what we call the resistance now. Now, back then you were counterculture and a radical, correct? You yeah, called the well, I mean, we call sure. it the resistance I mean, I now. Didn't, yeah, I didn't give it, I didn't give myself a label. That right. was other people, yeah. You know. But if you wanted to start a movement today, if you, if you were 25 today, and given mass communications and globalization, how would you start a movement today? Um, in what, I think you'd have, to, you'd have to ask yourself, where would you start it? Okay. Right? The dramatic story of working people in America, that, that thing that Bernie Sanders, and I, it's not a Sanders speech, tapped into. The Service Employees Union, the Farm Workers Union, and the Teamsters have formed an organization called Change to Win. They're using community campaigns to organize unorganized lower paid workers. The response of these lower paid workers or the, or the companies that they're targeting has been to file RICO suits, claiming that they're trying to extort the companies into paying more wages than they would have to. So, uh, it, for, before Jane and I represented the Service Employees Union in one such uh, lawsuit, uh, but not to do the legal work. So, what we we got a first-hand look at the impact of what organizing campaigns in communities can do. We are organizing and food workers and so forth and so on. So that's the first place I would start. The SEIU response to the RICO suit was uh, Sodexo brought the suit. And Sodexo was a subsidiary of a French corporation owned by Monsieur Ballon. So Monsieur Ballon was uh, treating labor unions in ways that he could never get away with in France under French law. So they hired me and I wrote three op-eds for French newspapers. And then we filmed a news commercial in French on the champs the things, uh, challenging M. Ballon to a debate, saying you'd never get away with this in France. Why are you exporting terrible labor relations? I gave two lectures at the University of Paris Nanterre about mondialization and, uh, and so on. And it was, it was just fun, you know? Hey, M. Ballon, je viens pour toi. Uh, it was great. I was kind of Alain Delon. But anyway, <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they dropped us. <laughs> Do, do you think there's some... Um, so, so that's orga organization. Right. There's so much energy out there. I don't mean to get off onto these yeah. egocentric trips, but there's a lot of energy out there, and it's people in motion. And what I, dis what I intensely dislike is the distrust that organized political groupings have, the distrust that they have for people in motion. You know? Yeah. So. Um, we have a question here about Brett Kavanaugh. Would you... What do you think? What is the question? About <laughs> well, what do you think? There are many questions. <laughs> There's a lot of questions. Well, um, I first met Brett Kavanaugh when he was on the Ken Starr Patrol. He was the person who, uh, our best recollection is, interrogated Wayne Rio before the Whitewater Grand Jury. So I, I start out with an attitude towards this person. Um, Second, I mean, Anthony Kennedy, he was a Kennedy clerk. Kennedy, I think, wanted to be a clerk. I have great respect for Justice Kennedy. I really do. That said, I think there's some warning flags here. I don't know about the story. You know, witnesses tell different stories. Oh, I can understand what the accuser must be going through. If she shows up there, she will be slut-shamed, uh, as all women who report non-consensual sexual advances or not assaulted advances are. That's just going to happen. Why she should, you know, so I understand that. There also is some evidence, the $200,000 credit card debt and so on, about what, about a gambling addiction. Now, I have a daughter who specializes in addiction medicine. I mean, I'm very, I understand that. But I think there's a peculiar vulnerability of people who, who have that problem. You know, uh, the, and the financial pressures that it may engender. 
you know, one of the reasons that Abe Fortas left the court was that he had a certain inability to deal with financial temptations. Um, so the money issue is really it's the money issue. interesting. Yeah. The, I mean, money, the, the man the, has the, no yeah. money, but money keeps showing up. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so, it's like his bank accounts are empty, and then yeah. his debts get paid. I mean, I, I think people should. I'm with you. I think people should be focusing on the money a little bit. Yes, more. well, yeah. I mean, this is a character. I mean, for heaven's sake, look, look at the scandals about judges in American history. You know, where is Judge Crater? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but see, then, no, two people laugh, right? They remember. But um, it, yeah, so I, I have these reservations. Okay, I disagree with about a whole lot of things. I've never argued a case in front of me, so you'd have to talk to the lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there, there are, one reason Justice Scalia was a bad justice of the Supreme Court was that he thought he already had the answers. This reference that Jordan made to this oral argument, he didn't care. Well, as Judge Higginbotham famously said at the Fifth Circuit Judicial Conference to his colleagues, you ought to listen to the lawyers once in a while, maybe you'd learn something. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, so. Um, so, one of the things you're admired for is you really believe that everybody deserves, I don't know about everybody, but most people deserve representation. And you've taken on some extremely controversial um, uh, clients. And, but I think you also said once that there, there does need to be a justification for taking on yeah. a particular client, right? So, can I ask you about a few clients? Sure. All right. Terry Nichols, why would you take that on? Got a phone call from the federal district judge in Oklahoma saying, I'm going to, I'd like to appoint you to this case. And I said, gee, I've finished being chair of the litigation section of the ABA. I've set myself out as an example. I don't think I can, you know, I don't think I should say no. But excuse me, sir, I'm in Austin, Texas. How the hell did you get this phone number? <laughs> um, and so I called Judge Higginbotham's chambers. And he answered the phone laughing. Um, now, I believe uh, he's there. Judge, you, you, you did have a role in this, right?
Other since you were in, we were co counsel just before you went on the bench the first time. All right. Um, do you um, do you still talk to Terry Nichols, by the way? Do you well, ever communicate with Terry Nichols? I have Nichols? not talked to Terry in a long time. Okay. I mean, we talked after the criminal case was over, the, the federal criminal case. They then started up in Oklahoma. And Judge Mage was nice enough to let us put together all of the defense material we had organized and to send it to the Oklahoma defense lawyers. But I need once again to put in a shout out. The first thing that I did to get appointed to represent Terry was went, reach out to Ron Woods. Right. And mm -hmm. our complementary approaches to what happened made this, I want to say, the best team trial experience of my life. You know, they're really great. And, you know, we have no trial. criticism of each other mm -hmm. except that doing our laundry after a long ocean passage, he folds his shirts and we come <laughs> out, and, and I still don't. Okay, that's just, but he was in the FBI, and I guess he had to do that. Well, it was, as a journalist, it was quite a, a change from the McVeigh trial, which had a very different legal team that was erratic. <laughs> we never knew what was going to go on there. So this was a very, very different button-down well, approach. We needed a severance from Steve Jones, McVeigh's lawyer, yeah. as much as we needed it from, uh, from McVeigh. Yeah. Steve Jones had he hired 21 lawyers, on the, and it was completely disorganized. He did a voir dire that I sniffed, could not understand what the point of it was. We looked at that jury and we said, That's, that guy in the back, the stockbroker from Fort Collins, man, he's leading the charge to give this guy the needle. Um, it, it, was, it was awful. And, and he kept, you know, there were these wild conspiracy theories in the media. You know, well, well, plus he was telling reporters he did it, which was... It was just really crazy. Yes. Well, that, yes, the final thing was he revealed wire client information. And I mean, yes, it was nuts. He killed so his it was, client. So it was a lot calmer when, when Mike took over the Nichols. Well, when Mike, <laughs> Mike and Ron and right. a team of lawyers decided that we were going to do something, we were going to present an alternative reality. Any of you going to practice criminal law, you can say reasonable doubt if you want but you must present jurors with a plausible alternative reality. Not to assume a burden of proof that you do not have, but to kind of hang the theory on. And so I started out the opening with that. Ron got up and started his opening statement by saying, members of the jury, the FBI did a wonderful job investigating this case for a day and a half. Um, pointing out that once they figured it out, they just quit looking. And that was you know, we we tried the case on that on that basis. Did they ever find John Doe number two? No, this was <laughs> no, they never did. <laughs> I don't think he existed. All yeah. right, um, John Demyanyuk. John Demyanyuk, as you recall, was convicted of being Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. He was denaturalized and then extradited to Israel to stand trial as Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. 
and had been convicted by the trial court in Israel of being this guard who had massacred thousands, tens of thousands of prisoners at the Treblinka death camp. Um, I got a call from the family, the Manyuk family, because the evidence had surfaced that indeed Demanyuk was innocent and that somebody, that he was not Ivan the Terrible and that the government had known that and that they had concealed it from the court. Um, the Sixth Circuit wrote a letter to the uh, Justice Department saying, we have this evidence, what happened? The government didn't answer. So I was appointed, along with Ed Merrick, the public defender for uh, Northern District of Ohio, to represent the man. And we went and tried the case and proved he was not Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka, which I, and, and the Court of Appeals issued this But decision. didn't he end up being somebody else? Well, he was Ivan the Merely Annoying, but uh, <laughs> he, um, <laughs> the, um, and, uh, and this idea of candor to the tribunal, which became the center of the case, I'm not going to go on at great length about this, 10 F. 3rd, 338 is the opinion, uh, 10 Federal 3rd, 338 is the opinion of the Sixth Circuit, it's a great opinion, cert was denied, and so on. Yes, then the government, having got him back into the United States, is Mike Churkin still here? Yeah, the, uh, uh, we got him back into the United States, which was pretty good because the government didn't didn't want to let him back in. They said, well, we denaturalized him. That's, that's the worst. There, we, I, oral argument. Well, I'm sitting there waiting to argue in the Sixth Circuit on this emergency habeas motion. And the New York Times reporter asks the Justice Department lawyer, uh, do you think the court's going to rule? And the Justice Department lawyer said, oh, yeah, Judge Merritt wants to see his kisser on national television, so I think we'll have an opinion before five. And a woman turned around and says, excuse me, I am Mrs. Merritt. And my husband is not going to be happy to hear that the Department of Justice is speaking of him in that way. Uh, so there's a moral of that story in there. Uh, <laughs> well, they then started a new denaturalization proceeding. And yes, we did lose that eventually. Um, I still believe that, that and we, I think we adequately proved, the court didn't agree with us, that they had withheld evidence that it was all based on a, what they said would have been his ID card. And they would never let us take the card apart to see why the staple holes didn't match up and the ink and so forth and so on. They put an expert, an expert witness was the guy that was the same expert as in the Martha Stewart case who got indicted for screwing up the lab results. And um, so... That's fascinating. I'm they sure, never I have Irish well. Alzheimer's. I only remember my grudges. Uh, <laughs> All right, Lynn Stewart. Lynn, um, Lynn was a lawyer. Uh, at, as you know, she was charged with, uh, you know, getting messages out from Sheikh Abdel Rahman. Um, to terrorists, that, right? To, to, yes. To well, to getting messages from this convicted guy out right. to everybody. Right, right. I mean, you know, I guess they read the. And Fostering terrorism. Well, well, that was, yes, that, that was, was based on the charge. Yeah. We lost. It was a nine-month trial. Mm -hmm. That was one of the worst trial experiences I have ever had in my life. Jill Shella, who was co-counsel, is here. We would, uh, I mean, I like John Kogel, okay? He's a federal district judge. I've known him. Um, the government would raise a point, and he would rule in our favor on the instruction. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the government would say, Your Honor, you know, we'd like to re-argue that point. And Judge Kodal, instead of saying, I've already ruled, would say, that's excellent. You can do that. Have a, have a letter in my office by 7 o'clock tonight. Fax it. And Mr. Tiger, you can respond by 10. And, um, and then I'll rule in the morning. And in the morning, we would kerfuffle around and do that. Well, of course, we had to go to trial the next day. So we were in trial for nine months. Um, we came in second. Uh, I've never lost a case. I've come in second a few times. <laughs> and this is good day. Um, but, but Kodal then gave her a very light sentence, even though we had gotten convicted of those things. And, um, you know, that, it is what it is. I represent it because I deeply believed in, in, the, in the principle of the thing. I thought the government behaved abominably. I thought that the, there were serious First Amendment issues. Um, and, uh, and, and I still think that. One of the questions we got here is, what is your greatest professional disappointment? Would that rank up there? No, no, no. 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 The greatest was, was 
would be, and Jordan remembers this, was Johnson versus Texas. We came in the short end of a five to four decision on a, in a capital case. In a what case? A capital case. Okay. Supreme Court decides. And, it, you know, the terrible thing in retrospect is that later on down the road, uh, the court has changed it and it, it wouldn't be decided the same way today. But in the meantime, Dorsey Johnson is executed. I was on vacation in England and got the word that, that we had lost five to four. And um, I, just didn't, I just didn't know what to do. Um, I, I just I went, I said, I didn't eat, I just said, okay, well, I just won't eat meat now for a while. I'm going to be responsible for killing anything with a face. Um, that, that, was, that was terrible because at oral argument, I mean, I thought we were head on point. You know? The Texas death penalty statute was flawed. Justice Souter would look, got it and interrogated the Texas lawyer. It's a great oral argument. It's in the archives. You can get the, the argument. Anyway, that was, that was tough. All right, two more questions, because I promised Karen I'd wrap it up here. Um, so you could, I don't want to stand between people and cocktails. Um, do you feel that there is an attack on the rule of law right now? Absolutely. Abs, of course. And, and this is the, the gathering in the name of. You can talk about the Twitter and all of this and that and the other thing. But look at it. We need to protect the country and therefore the Muslims. We need to build the wall and so forth and so on. This is this rampant executive power. And that's a wonderful thing. By the one of the Chagos cases, intermediate cases, was written by the opinion by Lord Justice Sedley, or Stephen Sedley, and I we've talked since then. But you know, this idea of the rampant, uncontrolled executive power behaving as though it's not subject to any limits. Fortunately, this is not a new issue. Right? No, no. The, the British Crown took the position they could do that. In 1608, Lord Cook stood in, in, in the House of Commons, he was just then Sir Edward, and said, God send me never to live under the law of conveniency or discretion, for if the soldier and the justice sit on the same bench, the trumpet will not let the crier speak in Westminster Hall. Now that is a clarion call for control of rampant executive power. And by God, the English shortened an English monarch by the length of a head uh, for not getting the point. And um, that's one of the disturbing things about the point, you know, about Kavanaugh, one of the disturbing things about these kind is this deference to the executive branch. But, uh, so yes, rampant. And, and what about the freedom of speech and the media, the attacks on the media? How well, dangerous is that? that? That is, it is, it is, of course it's disgraceful, and it is, you know, but again, it's not new. You read, read Justice Bunny's opinion though. in the New York Times <laughs> versus Sullivan. What the national media is undergoing now is rather similar to what was happening to the media in Alabama that led to New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, and it's the reason why your paper, that's why it's great to work for the Post, because at least back then, the Post didn't settle libel cases. And um, that meant that you, that you all, you know, you're going to spend a lot of money when, over at Williams and Connolly uh, <laughs> to, uh, to defend those cases. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it is, but I salute you. I worry. I worry for the people that are out there. Um, it's a very bad environment. Um, you know, the, the correspondents, when they go out to cover a Trump rally, they get spit on, they get yelled at. I mean, I think they're at risk because, oh, I mean, Trump points to them, and it's very tough out there. It, it is. It is. But if there's a, you know, I went to South Africa in 1988, and I looked at the guns and the dogs and so forth and so on, and I realized these lawyers, these people, these journalists, they lived under that system for those decades, right? And they, they kept on. You, I mean, you and your colleagues kept on. Our mutual friend, Bob Woodward, is unstoppable, right? Unbelievable, really. Isn't it right. something? All right, last question. When people um, come and uh, view your archives here and online, 
what do you want them to take away? Like, what, what do you want people to see as the greatest impact you have had on the law, on human rights, whatever? Wide question. Um, I want them to remember that line in the play, that it would be arrogant of me to think I stood at the center of all the events by which the world is moved. Um, I want them to, I, so, so I, mm -hmm. I want them to feel empowered to go and do and be, right? Not me, right? You gotta be yourself. Everybody else is taken. Um, and so that's what, what I would like, is to see all of the paths that are available that you can take. How many careers have you had? Several. Yeah. Well, a lot in journalism, but... But, but, but related, but yes. in different and guises different areas, and things yeah. and so on. And Repotting, yeah. Yeah. And, um, so you want it to inspire people, inspire young lawyers? Mm -hmm. And not just to inspire, not like a sermon that you no, would hear, no, but right? But, what's possible. Um, yeah, but, but based on evidence. Mm -hmm. As Edward Bennett Williams said, opening in a Connolly case, you know, this is an opening statement. It's not like theirs. It's, uh, this is a... But this is not like, this is what we intend to we confidently believe and expect the evidence will show. It's not like a politician's promise where you hear it and maybe they keep it, maybe they don't. You won't vote for your seat if they kept their promise. It's with a skeptical eye. Well, thank you for your contribution. Lois, thank you for coming. <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you're going to be up here, and I'd like to ask um, all of the folks who are in the room who have worked on the archive. Um, so, Patrick and Annie, who I mentioned before, um, Billy Chandler, who I didn't see before, who has come back um, to visit us tonight, um, Sarah Eliason, who um, the people who are here from afar and have been on round tables um, are here because of all of the work that Sarah's put in um, to this project generally. Um, Ariel, you've already met. Um, Dan Brinks, my co-director. Jordan Steiker, um, who did part of the oral histories. Michael Tiger, I think you had a little bit to do with it. You can come back now. Um, Don Carlton, you're not up here yet. <laughs> Um, so, um, after we have, okay, it's a ceremonial click, you could check on your phones, but don't. Um, we're about to go live, um, and, you know, one of the great things is this event is going to be part of the archive, so the archive does continue to expand, okay. um, and as does your new book, yes. um, which, out, available on Amazon. <laughs> but apologies of state and monopoly power. Um, for anyone concerned with the rule of law, or more generally with the real significance of freedom and justice, about to read the Jacobler. This highly informed and carefully argued study should be essential reading. Noam Chomsky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the big dogs now. Mom. <laughs> we're going to go over here so we can actually see the launch. Okay. Um, and, you know, I also want to say that there are other students in here who are going to keep working on it um, because it is going to continue to grow. So, um, anyway, we need to turn the lights down.